Yo, what's good, E7 fam? Pat here to talk about the February 16th balance adjustment preview that was just shown earlier this morning over on Stove. If you are somebody who's watched these in the past, welcome back. If you are a new viewer, what I try to do in these balance adjustment previews is I take a look at the characters and artifacts, and I kind of jot down some notes from my personal experience playing in like the Emperor range for World Arena, as well as my overall game experience as a day one player in Epic 7, and kind of use those notes to kind of see what I personally would feel would be needed for the character in order to be more effective in specific areas, whether that's PvE, Guild Wars, World Arena, Regular Arena, so on and so forth. And then we kind of compare and contrast those notes and see if we could kind of make a judgment call of whether or not it is actually a good buff. And that's served as a very good model for me in the past, but this one, I'm not so sure of how it'll pan out. And you'll see why when we take a look at the actual balance adjustment targets. I honestly think this might be one of the strangest balance adjustment previews that we have ever gotten. I am quite puzzled by a number of the choices that they chose for not only the characters and artifacts, but also the actual changes themselves. So in this video, we're going to talk about Ambitious Tywin, Melissa, Kisei, Fairytale Tenebria, Mui, uh, Church of Ilros Axe, and Chaos Sect Axe. Those are the same unit, basically. For the rest of the video, I'm going to refer to them by their name, Axe God, which is like the community fan nickname that pretty much everyone's called him since the beginning of the game. So we'll just call him Axe God for the rest of the video. And we're also going to talk about Guide to a Decision, as well as Wall of Order uh, for the artifacts. So, first up, we have Ambitious Tywin. So, I've talked about Ambitious Tywin in a lot of my videos in the past. I think he is a solid character. Not a bad character by any means. I have actually used him several times across this you know, past season that is just ending today as of the recording of this video. What Tywin really needs is a lot of room to breathe. He needs a slower meta. That's where he really benefits. I've said that before in things like my recruitment, my ML5 star recruitment video. He just really favors slower meta games. And unfortunately, we are in a metagame where you are either favored if you are aggressive or you are favored if you have a lot of debuffs. So, if you were going to be nerfing Crimson Seed with this balance adjustment, then it would stand to reason, if we're in a debuff-heavy meta right now, that you would also want to see Battle Command actually be able to be procced more than once a turn, kind of like Edward Elric actually is right now, where he originally... Equivalent exchange could only proc once. Now it could proc as many times as possible. I would have liked to have seen that for Battle Command. I think that would be very, very helpful, especially when you have characters like Death Dealer Ray, as well as Pirate Captain Flynn, which could be very, very oppressive if your opponent bans uh, correctly, whether it's a pre ban or their post ban. There is a staggeringly low amount of answers to that us outside of being a very aggressive player. So if you're a slower player like myself, there's surprisingly not too many good answers in the pool, and we are having even more answers yanked away from us with this Crimson Seat nerf. So a change to Battle Command would have been a pretty good change. So what did we actually get? Well, they changed Icy Sword Storm. It now has, when the caster is in rage, ignores effect resistance. So essentially, it is a provoke that has a 75% chance to go through regardless of the target's ER. Uh, it still has that four souls removed, which is always nice. Uh, I'm not usually a huge fan of things that ignore effect resistance, unless they are something akin to like how Teyu has it right now, where if the opponent triggers it, then that's their fault. And this kind of is in line with that because it triggers off of battle command, which we'll talk about now. So Battle Command now gives Ambitious Tywin in Rage whenever he actually gets attacked. So basically, if he gets hit and dispels something, uh, then he will get this in Rage. It's not exactly clear from the wording if it has to actually dispel a debuff to get in Rage. If he actually just gets hit and gets in Rage, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, this actually is pretty like good overall because it does you know, address one of the actual major concerns that Tywin does have. He, again, is favored in a slower meta, so if you give him a way to actually speed himself up, then his clock gets much, much shorter, which is always really, really nice. So even though it doesn't necessarily mean it is a slower meta, 
if you speed Tywin up, he might actually be allowed to play in some of these faster metagames. So I would say that's a pretty good uh, win for the most part. It doesn't actually address the thing I was talking about otherwise, though, which is making Battle Command more than once per turn, which might have been overkill, but when you've seen some of the games that I've seen where, like, your opponent pre-bans, like, Mediator, Kawarik, and Edward Elric, and they are trying to go, like, Ray Solitaria, Pirate Captain Flan, um, that's just really oppressive, and there's just not enough tools uh, in the actual pool for us to, like, reliably answer that. Like, your best chance is just ban Ray and then, like, pray for the best. Uh, so yeah, that would have been nice, but maybe it would have potentially been overkill. Speaking of overkill, they also changed Flash, which was already the best part about the kit and is why he's still at least playable because soul burning Flash is absolutely ridiculous. So now, instead of it being an 80% chance to stun the entire enemy team and also decrease their speed, it is now a 80% chance to stun as well as a defense break, which is a pretty huge change because AoE defense breaks, if you've played against Briar Witch Asseria at all in this previous threat, is incredibly strong and it can wrap games up in a hurry. The fact that it also has when the caster is in rage ignores effect resistance. Wow, yikes. Um, <laughs> that's very, very devastating. If Battle Command does proc when you hit Ambitious Tywin, whether he dispels a debuff or not, this would make him like brutal against characters that have AoE moves that they are really trying to use. Like a character like Bellion who could only AoE attack. If you basically are guaranteed to give Ambitious Tywin a AoE stun defense break that cannot be resisted by anybody, wow, yikes. Like that's just grounds for wiping out the opponent's team. So we'll have to see how it goes because Tywin could go from being slightly better where he was already like, I'd say like a tier three character. He might be like slightly good enough to be like a tier two character in my eyes. If he gets the enrage for just being hit period, he could be an incredibly powerful bruiser counter pick that could again, just like reverse cleave the opponent or reverse control the opponent very, very easily. So we have to keep an eye on whether or not Enrage triggers off of, again, a hit or off of a you know, buff be, debuff being dispelled. So really, really important. This is definitely, I think, the character to keep your eye on in this patch because the rest of the stuff that we're going to talk about from here on out, I think, is a lot rougher. And you'll understand why when we get to the next character, which is Melissa. Does Melissa really need anything at this point? Melissa has been buffed, I think, more than any character in Epic 7 history at this point. I don't actually know how many times she's been buffed, but I think it's something like four buffs and an EE, and this might be her fifth, or it's like three buffs and an EE, and this is her fourth. The character has been buffed a lot. And along with the seven speed for mages from this past season, she was a really good last pick for cleave teams. I know I didn't play against her this season, but that's because I always ended up having to pre-ban her, or I should say post-ban her, because I respect the character, because I think she is a really strong uh, finisher for aggressive teams. She's in like a better spot than, say, Luna, for example. Um, so this character, I just didn't feel like needed anything, really. They already were in a very good spot. So let's take a look at what they got. So Manifestation now has... Damage dealt increases proportional to caster's lost health. This is, I believe, Melissa's S2. I do not actually play Melissa, but that move gives her immortality for one turn. And obviously, the character will be uh, very low on health if they get hit while in immortality. They'll survive, go to one HP, and then the damage dealt will increase. This is very Kron esque This is kind of how Kron works as well. So giving her that little bit of quality of life change so that she's in line with a character like Kron who has a similar immortality mechanic, sure, I'm all for it. Let's scroll down here to talk about Blood Bloom, specifically the Awakened version. You now acquire three souls instead of two, and then Curse was changed. Curse used to be a portion of the damage inflicted on allies by single attacks will also be suffered by the target as additional damage at the end of the turn. It now has a portion of the damage inflicted on allies except for the target, by single attacks will also be suffered by the target as additional damage at the end of the turn. 
if you read down here with the skill description, it says the damage inflicted on the target under the curse effect will be significantly increased, making it easier for her to suppress enemies. However, the curse effect will no longer cause the target to take additional damage when receiving direct damage. Basically, what they're saying here is before Melissa players would basically S3 you into S2 on the same person to wipe out one target. They, I guess, don't want that play pattern to be a thing. So instead, what they're doing is they're upping the curse damage so that you can hopefully still get the kill like you would normally. But instead, you can just S3 into S2 onto a different target and still get that two for one. So instead of just outright killing one target, now you have the chance to do uh, a kill on one target and severely wound or potentially kill a second target. So that's the play pattern they're trying to encourage. Again, I don't really think this does a whole heck of a lot for the character. She's already good in my eyes. You're still picking her in the same spots. Those spots don't, like, there's not more spots opening up, right? Like, you're still picking Melissa as, like, a last pick, you know, for an, a very aggressive cleave or aggro team. That's not changing. Like, this doesn't make her suddenly, like, a mid or, like, a first pick in World Arena. She's going to be slightly better in the spots that you pick her in. But, again, those spots are still going to be... Uh, niche for the most part so again i didn't really think this character needed a whole heck of a lot to be good i already considered her good so to see her here again uh, it just feels like blatant favoritism i used to joke that smilegate uh, and super creative really really like tenebria because they keep buffing tenebrias uh, across the board which we will talk about a tenebria by the way in this video um but I just, at this point, Melissa, I think, takes the cake. She has Eclipse Tenebria as, like, their, I guess, favorite waifu. Somebody at the office really wants to see Melissa at the next Epic Seven World Championship, apparently. Next up is one of my favorite damage dealers to play, or at least historically in the past, and that is Kisei. So Kisei is in a really weird spot because she is a character that was designed and made in a time when the triangle meta as i like to call it wasn't broken so the way that the game used to be and the way that i think it should be because i think it's a really healthy and uh diverse format is that you have bruisers are the standard team that a lot of people like to play like myself because they you know it's just a very uh balanced team type but the thing about bruisers is that they're super easy to control with these mid-speed characters that have a lot of debuffs. Characters historically like Basar or even like a fairy tale Tenebrea, right? But the thing is, those characters only have like 115 to 118 speed. And you know what beats those? Assassins. Single target assassins burst characters that can go even faster than that. So you have assassins that can burst the debuffers the debuffers control the bruisers but the assassins don't do enough damage to actually kill the bruiser team so essentially that's like your meta you have the slow team which beats the fast team the mid speed team beats the slowest team and then the fastest team beats the mid speed team that's kind of how it should kind of work somewhere along the way with general power creep we have made it so that the debuffers you know, that should have been in the 115 speed range are like 129, like Ran, or like 128, like Para, or 121, like Conqueror Lilius. And those characters have made it so that characters like Assassin Kali, who historically was very strong, don't actually work anymore because they're just slower than the characters that they are designed to actually kill. So Kisei is very much in this same boat. Kisei does not start in stealth and she's just not faster than a character like conquer lilius or a character like Lyca or ran or Pera. so that is the biggest issue you have characters like coeric for example who are roughly around the same speed as her and those see play but that's because that is a mage whereas kisei is a thief so if red hand guy gets killed He's probably still leaving behind 20 souls because he's holding Ancient Book, right? So he still has impact even in a game when he essentially does nothing. Uh, and then also in the spots where you're picking him, he just has a guaranteed way to reset the character. Kisei is not a guaranteed way to reset the character. 
So what I'm basically getting at here is Kisei either needs to, one, start in stealth, uh, two, change classes so she can start in stealth or hold a book, three, get more speed, or four, uh, you know, have a different soul burn that makes it so that her S3 is a guaranteed uh, pushback on the cooldowns. Because that's pretty much, I think, all that's going to help her. I don't really think anything else will change anything. She has damage for days. So I don't understand why we're going to talk about here in a second. They decided to go with damage dealt increased. So Dark Scar, they just increased the damage on it. Dark Scar, if you are a Kisei with a lot of damage on her and is already in stealth, will rip through a team already. It does an impressive amount of damage. Even a character like Apocalypse Ravi, if there is no actual mitigation on the enemy team, unless they're on Proof of Valor, it will rip through her pretty serious. Like If it doesn't outright kill her, it'll put her pretty low uh, in terms of health. So Dark Scar definitely did not need a damage increase. It already borderline cleaves a lot of characters in this game. So I don't think that increasing the damage on Dark Scar really addresses any of this character's core problems. On top of that, Nocturne, now it does give a barrier when you use it. That barrier strength will be increased so that, that way she can sit in stealth and therefore make sure that she gets the extra penetration on Dark Scar. Again, I don't really think that that's... I think you're missing the issue here, guys. <laughs> Whoever on the balance team is trying to help Kisei out here, you are missing the issue. The problem is, right now, characters slower than Conquer Lilius do not get to play the game, and then the characters that could potentially be faster than her do not get to play the game because of Zeo unless they are in stealth at the start of the fight. So... This does not start Kisei in stealth. It does not make her faster. Uh, it does not let her hold book. So I don't think any of these changes are really going to help Kisei. Like that's unfortunately the state of fast characters in Epic Seven. You had like if you if you don't pass the Zeo slash Conquer Lilius test, thanks for playing. Hope you're a bruiser or hope you do something completely degenerate if you actually get a turn like a character like say. Uh, Death Dealer Ray or like Pirate Captain Flat. Fairy Tale Tenebria is the next character we're going to talk about. And Fairy Tale Tenebria, if you haven't played with her recently, is still really insanely good. Assuming that one, your opponent doesn't have Mediator Quirk, and two, you actually have the first turn. So the biggest problem with Fairy Tale Tenebria is the same exact problem that we just talked about with Kisei, although it's not quite as bad because this is a mage that could potentially hold book if you really wanted her to and in fact you probably should because book is broken alongside guiding light so the only thing that really helps this character is does it help her pass the zeo slash conquer lilius test in this case it would have to be the conquer lilius test this character just needs more speed the character is incredibly strong to begin with if you can actually get a turn on her, and again, your opponent doesn't have a character like Mediator Kawarik. So, what did we actually get? The S1 one pair now has a 75% chance to inflict redirected provoke for one turn instead of a 45% chance to inflict up to two different poison effects. I actually think this is a much better change because it synergizes really, really well with her uh, S2 passive wildcard. Really think that's very, very good overall. In fact, this opens up a new build path for Fairy Tail Tenebria, in my opinion, because previously, uh, countering with two poisons, not really that big of a game impact. However, if you had a mid speed bruiser one of these, you could absolutely make a counter one that could potentially inflict redirected provoke. And, you know, if you have some damage on you there, the shuffle effect from wild card actually could be pretty potent uh in the past i used to play red tenebria in like the first or second season as a counter character because her s1 was asleep so if you built her bulky and you actually attacked into her with like an aoe there was a chance that you could get slept and you would incur essentially a loss of turn that very same strategy can be applied with the change to one pair here so you could potentially play this character at like maybe 220 230 speed very bulky on counter 
that might be a bit too fast. Uh, I would have to actually look at her numbers. I think she's 115 speed, 114. Um, so some kind of reasonable amount of speed on her on counter set with some good bulk could be a fun build for you all to try out. Um, how good it is remains to be seen. But again, just this change alone does open up a build path. So that's already kind of a win in my book. On top of that, we've made it so that the damage on shuffle is increased. And then also they got rid of unhealable on the random debuff and gave it to decreased speed instead. So it looks like overall the use cases on this character are a bit better. When you can actually play the character, you know, it's a bit better. Like Redirect to Provoke has better synergy overall with the kit as opposed to Poison to make her seem more like a regular Tenebria. And again, increased damage on the Shuffle, which already wasn't that great to begin with, but now it's a bit better. And then again, the only debuff on her that was not super relevant, which changed to one that actually is quite a bit relevant. I actually like this set of changes. I actually think that this might be my favorite set of changes overall in the patch because what would make this character like super, super good would be, like I said, to make her faster. But that's really not fun. When Fairy Tail Tenebri is good, I don't think anybody really seriously likes when this character is super, super good uh, or at least super fast. The fact that they have made it so that her use cases when she's good are better and then also introduced a new potential play pattern makes me feel pretty good. Like if Fairy Tail Tenebri started to show up en masse as like a bruiser, I think I would feel pretty good about that because of that triangle we talked about before because you could potentially have a character uh, just burst her before she actually ended up getting a turn. Like if this character ever became like super oppressive, you could draft like a mage plus like Assassin Kali and just soul burn and kill the character outright in one hit. So again, I think this is a bit healthier than just simply saying we need to make this character better, just make her stupidly fast like they've done to some characters in the past. So overall, I think, like I said, this is probably my favorite set of changes from this entire patch. Next up is Mui, one of my guildmates' absolute favorite characters in the entire game and a character I am, you know, woefully inexperienced with. I have very little experience with uh, Mui as an actual character. I know that she is a Virgo warrior. It, she's primarily also designed as an opener so again if i had to give her anything it's probably going to be extra speed because the state of the game basically mandates that debuffers need to be either very fast or very oppressive in some way so let's take a look at what we got here so before lash gave a random debuff for one turn when she hit you and the Soul Burn would increase the effect chance to 100% and inflict two random debuffs instead. They've changed the Soul Burn, and we'll talk more about that in a second. And instead have made it so that Lash now gives target for two turns, which will help increase the damage on your team. So I think having a bit of consistency in the kit is a bit better. Random debuffs are cool and all, but they're only really good if all of those random debuffs are actually relevant in a given game. Giving her target kind of gives her a bit of focus and does allow her to do, uh, I think, a better job supporting her team because that's basically what she is. She's like a debuffer slash support hybrid with things like attack buff. Next up, we have the S2 punishment, which is probably the best move on the character previously because it was an AoE stun. So they didn't change anything with the base move, although they did decrease the damage that it dealt. They did not increase it. They decreased it. And they moved the soul burn to this for 20 souls. All skill cooldowns decreased by two turns. Correct me if I'm wrong, but punishment is, I believe, four turns to begin with. So soul burning this means that it's every other turn at the cost of 20 souls. I feel like this soul burn is actually slightly overcosted. I feel like it should be 10 souls. Uh, let me know down in the comments below if you actually play Mui and you actually feel that way. Because I feel like this is a little bit overcosted of a soul burn. It's not an extra turn um doesn't ignore effect resistance so like when you compare it to other 20 cost soul burns like apocalypse robbie is like a huge heal on her and a huge single target nuke um this one just doesn't really feel like it stacks up to some other 20 cost soul burns that are in the game and then finally we have here grand finale at least for as far as her skills are concerned 
So it now has an additional effect. It increases the combat readiness of the caster by 25% per critical hit. So now, if you built her with 100% crit chance, kind of like how you build Faithless Lydica, where it's like 100% crit, no actual damage on the character, no crit damage at least, so that way you can get high effectiveness and high speed, then you're essentially taking an extra turn on this character. So they also had to change the cooldown on this move to five turns. And it gives two souls now instead of three. And that is because you essentially are getting to go grand finale into punishment immediately. Which is, I think, the big change here. So I think, overall, with the changes to just the move set, I think Mui is in a better spot. If you could actually use her in a specific spot, then she's going to be very, very good. Because now you're going to get to go S3 immediately dispel buffs from everybody, give your whole team an attack buff, then you're going to potentially get a 100% CR, and then use punishment, bleed out the enemy team, and then also stun them. So that is a pretty potent combination. Uh, will you have the stats to actually make it work, though? I'm not so sure, because the Virgo stat line on Warriors is pretty mid-speed, and the stat line is kind of all over the place. So now you need high effectiveness. You will need to have 100% critical hit chance now to make sure that you get that extra turn. You still need speed. And then on top of that, this is a character that is traditionally not in the fastest speed bracket. They don't have access to Guiding Light, so she's super susceptible to Zeo, to Conquer Elias, to all the things that we talked about. When she's good, I think that she is significantly better. Like The, the kit is more cohesive overall with these changes. I just don't think it is enough to have her make a super big impact in world arena will she be a lot better for like regular arena or like go wars absolutely but i just don't think that this is enough to help this character for world arena really cool though because i again i do think that this kit is much more cohesive we are all in now on that you know initiator support hybrid with this character with the changes like we already had attack buff but now we have target for increased damage and then like i said we have a full strip right into the silence and the bleed Imprint Concentration uh, is changed to Effectiveness to kind of help alleviate the stats that you need for this character. Because remember, again, you need Effectiveness in order to actually debuff characters. I think a better Imprint Concentration for this would have actually been Critical Hit Chance. Because we need to have the 100% Critical Hit Chance in order to make this actually work. If you gave her Critical Hit Chance... Um, I'm not exactly sure what her starting crit chance is. Let's say if it was 27, which is the highest, then you would have 43 from the imprints. And then if you gave her a crit chance necklace, which is like 55 to 60%, that would be enough. I could definitely see that being the case. I think that would have been a pretty good imprint. The loss of the dual attack chance, though, is kind of rough. Because I know that uh, a buddy of mine really does like the dual attack chance imprint. So I'll be curious to see after this video goes live what his actual thoughts are uh, on the changes to the imprint concentration. There's also a change here to the exclusive equipment. Uh, number two, before it was 35% chance to grant an extra turn after using the S3, which is basically guaranteed now. So there's not really a reason to have this EE anymore. It now has grants enhanced dual attack to the ally with the highest attack after using grand finale. Correct me if I'm wrong, but enhanced dual attack chance is what uh, Summer Charlotte has access to, which means that the next actual uh, auto attack from somebody on your team will trigger a guaranteed dual attack, which is pretty good, honestly. It's Again, it makes the character more cohesive. That's what we're talking about. This is like a support slash debuffer hybrid, and I think these changes, again, really highlight that. I think if characters like Ran and your Paras and your Conqueror Lilies weren't so fast as debuffers. Like if these were all characters that were between like 113 to 118 speed, I think Mui would be really, really good. Like on paper, this set of changes is very, very nice. It's just, it's unfortunate that again, we live in a world where speed has to be a certain way. Fast characters have to be a certain way or they're just not going to make any impact at the highest level. All right, next up, let's talk about Axe God. I'm going to actually skip past all of Church of Ilros Axe and just go right on to Chaos Sect Axe because he's essentially just the same character but better, right? All right, 
So I must confess, I've never really played Axe God. My guild mates used to play him all the time when the game first came out because he was an incredible specialty change at the start of the game's life. He kind of fell by the wayside due to general power creep. And then they eventually reworked him and made him into a health scaling bruiser as well as supposedly an anti-light character. Kind of like how Little Queen Charlotte is an anti-dark character. That kind of didn't pan out because the multipliers on everything were just absolutely garbage. So I think I have to put down here increased damage is I think the biggest thing he needs. Otherwise, just give him another rework or at least revert the one you gave him because he really is seeing play absolutely nowhere. Whereas before, he had a pretty dedicated user base. Uh, you know, He was very niche, but there were people who really loved playing him and they completely gutted the character and made him just completely un unusable almost everywhere. So let's see what they actually gave him. So Disconnect, that's his S1, before was changed to a health scaling move. It is now... Uh, it's now a health scaling move. <laughs> like, green text means good, right? Like, I can assume that this means they increase the damage on the S1, right? I think we're on the same page here, right? You and I watching this video, that this means green text good, right? I, let me scroll back up here to Mewi real fast. Green text for damage dealt decreased. Okay. Uh, yeah. I guess it's an increase in damage, question mark? I'm not really sure. <laughs> We're going to put that one down as question mark. Next up, we have his S2, which is attack chain. This is his AoE side swipe with the axe. Uh, it used to give you two souls when you used it. It now gives you one soul when you use it. But the trade-off is that it now has a 60% chance to AoE provoke for one turn. Uh, I could take it or leave it. AoE Provoke, especially at this low of a chance, it really doesn't do a whole heck of a lot unless it's like Sanya's, where it's like 85 plus percent, because then you could control a whole team with it potentially. Yeah, um, okay change, nothing fantastic though. Then we have changed the S3. Instead of giving one soul, it now gives two souls. So they basically swap the soul game. That's like, this is like the most... This, like, block of text right here, these, like, six panels is, like, some of the most worthless, te like, text changes I've ever seen. Like, there's basically nothing here. Like, I haven't seen uh, a block of green text that's, like, almost this irrelevant since Judge Kise got her, quote-unquote, buff, where they just took the skills and just moved them around. <laughs> like, we just swapped the soul gain and gave, like, a very, like, inconsequential AoE provoke. Okay. So we've also changed a couple of runes on this character. Wedge rune used to give 5% crit hit chance. It now gives, after being attacked by a light elemental target, has a 100% chance to increase the effectiveness of the caster for one turn. It's only going to be activated once per turn. Uh, I think I rather might have potentially wanted the critical hit chance, but I understand. Spoiler alert. If we jump down here to imprint concentration, they changed the concentration for flat attack to critical hit chance, which... That's a big win, by the way. That might be the best thing that he got because it helps lighten the load on stats for this character. So if we had to have either 5% or 11.2%, I'm taking the 11.2 all day, but it would have been nice to have 16.2. Uh, this one is just a, just an okay uh, change, I think. It'll help with the defense break and the provoke chance that are in his kit, but uh, otherwise it's a very whatever change. Obscurity Room, after using Attack Chain, has a 50% chance to extend the duration of any immunity buff granted to the caster by one turn. So basically, before when you use the S2, it gives a one turn immunity. There's a chance it could give a two turn immunity. Now it has increases damage dealt by Attack Chain by 10%. I think I would rather have the 10% damage on this because like this is guaranteed, whereas this is a 50-50 chance, and like not every match does this matter. This will matter in almost every match that you play this character in, or every game mode that you play this character in. Courage Rune. After being attacked, increases attack of the caster by 6%. Effect can stack up to 5 times. So this was essentially his way of ramping up his damage. Uh, he already has low damage even with this thing, so what did we change it to? When an ally is attacked by a light elemental enemy, it has a 15% chance to counterattack with attack chain. 
So that's actually kind of interesting. So now he is kind of more in that anti-light niche that we talked about, but it's not really that high of a percentage. Like we just released a three-star uh, Talese who has innate 40% crit hit chance. Like why couldn't have this been a much higher percentage chance to counter a light unit? Like that would have made him truly scary against a lot of light units. And we definitely need that because Light is definitely running stuff right now. Like, Spectre Tenebria is definitely, like, the best dark hero, but, like, Light is really good. You have Arwell, you have Aiden, um, you have, like, Maid Chloe is starting to make some of a resurgence, you have Bellion, uh, you have Lionheart Sermia. Like, there are a lot of very, very strong Light units that are currently in the game. So having a check to them would be pretty nice, especially because Dark has such pronounced checks like Savior Aiden, like Little Queen Charlotte. So, yeah, I think we could have, we definitely could have jumped this number up. Like, 15% is definitely rookie numbers. Like, this could have been, I think, 30% chance easily, and then you could pair it with a counter set, and then he'd be something truly scary. Overall, though, I don't think it's enough. They didn't actually address, like, the major change that he needed, which I think was the extra damage on the Vigorous Strike. Like, we got, we got something, right? It looks like we're getting some increased damage on the S1, but I just don't think it's enough because I think it's the S3 multiplier is what people were really, really upset about. All right, let's talk about the two artifacts before we wrap up this video. First up is Guide to a Decision. Uh, if I could change anything on it, either make the barrier bigger or rework it into something that's more usable because right now it is very niche. You have characters like Holiday Euphini are like really the only ones out here using this thing. There's like one or two other use cases I've seen in the past, but really this is just Holiday Euphine's artifact most of the time. In the past, Shu used to use it a little bit. But yeah, pretty much again, Holiday Euphine uh, exclusive artifact. So now the barrier strength, it was 20%. It is now 30% at the start of the turn. Cool. It makes Holiday Euphine slightly better. It doesn't improve any use cases. Doesn't really help the character out uh, too much or other characters should say too much overall. So yeah, better artifact, but it really doesn't help its playability too much. Like the one or two characters that were already using it will be glad that you helped them out ever so slightly. But this is like pretty tame. They could have, for their one to like three artifact slots that they do in each of these patches, they could have been, you know, there could have been so many other things they could have chosen. They could have chosen Knowledge Seed, for example. That thing desperately needs a rework uh, in the worst way. And then next up is Wall of Order, or, or as the Twitch chat sometimes refers to it, Wall of Copium. Uh, yeah, so Wall of Order, no matter what you change this to, it does not matter what you change this to. If it's not better than Guiding Light, it's probably not seeing any play. So you either need to nerf or change Guiding Light, or you need to massively increase the amount of stealth hate in the game besides a character like Milo and potentially maybe even Bihu uh, in the short term. Those are like pretty much it for like stealth hate. Like we really need more stealth hate in the game because the game right now, it just revolves around stealth and Zeo and Conqueror Lilius. Like those characters pretty much like those dynamics dictate the entire game. So no matter what a Ranger artifact is, it will always be compared to Guiding Light at the highest, most competitive level of play. So again, almost nothing that is in Wall of Order's text, unless it says starts the fight in stealth or like grants stealth hate, is going to be good enough. Like that's that's just the reality of, again, the game that we are currently playing. So before, what Wall of Order did was at the start of the turn for each buff granted to an enemy has a 4-8% to chance to grant the caster greater attack buff for one turn after using an attack that targets all enemies increases combat radius of the caster by 10 percent. this effect is not activated by a counter attack dual attack or extra attack remember this is landy's limited artifact so it was meant to synergize with landy who is a aoe attack character that punishes people for having quite a lot of buffs so now it has at the start of the turn for each buff granted to the enemy has a five to ten percent chance to grant greater attack buff for one turn so against debuff or i should say buff heavy team compositions this is probably going to proc a lot more often at the end of the turn grants a barrier equivalent to 25 to 50 percent of the caster's attack for one turn 
For counter Landy, I definitely could see this being useful. And maybe, maybe Operator Cigarette, because she's the only one that's really using Wall of Water right now. That might also be quite good. But I think for almost everyone else, I think you'd rather just have Guiding Light, right? Like, Guiding Light is just supremely hard to beat because you have to pivot to a ton of AoEs in order to interact with Guiding Light. And AoE characters are not very strong right now. All the single target characters are really the strong ones. You get punished really hard for trying to play a lot of AoE. So if a character has like a Spectre Tenebria and a Guiding Light and then two characters that punish you for having AoE, it's really, really rough out here. So I'm not going to completely write this artifact off because it's definitely strong, right? Like I said, counter set Landy is probably going to love this thing because it gives you that survivability that they're using Bloodstone for right now. And to supplement the fact that it is a slower, bulkier Landy, it's going to be firing off a greater attack buff almost every single turn. So definitely strong set of changes, but it's just, it. Guiding Light has basically taken a foothold on the game in a way the ancient book has like before i used to say arius was the best artifact in epic 7 with ancient book being the second best artifact in epic 7 i think right now that book and guiding light are the two best artifacts in the game they're pretty much tied for number one and then arius is like a distant third at this point because the only characters that are really playing arius right now are like yulha and adventure raz like even arwell Arwell has a built-in one. So, like, Arius really has kind of fallen out of favor. And the two predominant artifacts, like I said, are Ancient Book and Guiding Light. So, whenever a Mage or a Ranger artifact comes out, it's going to always be compared to both of these two options. And I don't think that that's healthy long-term for the game. And I do think they probably will need to address it at some point because it's really, really limiting design space and really making games feel very samey. Like, play patterns are very, very samey at this point in Epic 7. And that's pretty much gonna be it for this actual video. Let me know down in the comments below. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? I should have another video out either super late tonight or tomorrow. I was like rank 300 or so for the RTA season, uh, but I think I've decayed obviously slightly uh, since this morning, since we actually like stopped climbing for the season, but everything else can, you know, considered i probably should be ending an emperor so i will do another uh emperor account review and just show only the characters that i use the ones i specifically favorited uh if you guys are, are keen to see that you guys can tune back in either again super late tonight or tomorrow i'll kind of just go over my thoughts on the triumph season and how i feel like things panned out uh but yeah other than that enjoy the rest of your day enjoy your weekend and i will catch you all in the next one later now